friends, this is Elal Wakeji Kamore and welcome to Reflections by Wakeji Kamore. <laughs> we are currently going through the book of 1st Samuel. We are doing this chapter by chapter. So it'll be nice for you to listen to the end of this recording because the lessons from the chapter which we will be reading today will be at the end. Also, if you're here and it's your first time here, kindly subscribe. Or if you're listening and you've not subscribed, please subscribe and click the notification bell so you never miss any new recording or new video that I put up. Today we are going to be reading First Chamor chapter 4 which I'll be reading with from the NLT version, which is the New Living Translation version, with the key lessons shared at the end. So kindly, kindly follow through. Right. So just to remind you, please note that this book of First Samuel is still happening, or rather in this season that we are at, it's still happening during the time of Judges. Israelites still don't have a king. So they are still doing the things they want to do. They are still doing things that are right in their own eyes. And they are still suffering the consequences of their own actions. And most of those consequences were that other nations would overpower them. Other nations will fight with them. Other nations will take their harvest. Other nations will make them slaves and just simply oppress them. So that's the space that we are in. All right, let me read it. It says, And Samuel's word words went out to all the people of Israel. At the time, at that time, sorry, at that time, Israel was at war with the Philistines. As I've as mentioned, they are still at war with other nations. So at this specific time, they were at war with the Philistines. And the Israelites' army were camped near Ebenezer. And the Philistines were at Aphek. The Philistines as attacked and defeated the army of Israel, killing 4,000 men. After the battle was over, the troops treat, retreated to their camp. And the elders of Israel asked, why did the Lord allow us to be defeated by the Philistines? Then they said, Let's bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from Shiloh. If we carry it into battle with us, it, it will save us from our enemies. Please note, they are saying that the Ark of the Covenant or the Ark of the Tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant of God will save them. Not necessarily God, but they are placing this whole trust and this whole faith on the Ark itself. So they went they, they sent some men to Shiloh to bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of the heaven, Heaven's armies, who is enthroned between Cherubim, Hophni and Phinehas. Remember these two guys, the scoundrels, greedy idiots that were the sons of Eli, were also there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. When all the Israelites saw the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord coming into their camp, they shouted with joy so loud that it made the ground shake. What's going on? The Philistines asked. What's all the shouting about in the Hebrew camp? When they were told that it was because the ark of the Lord had arrived, they panicked. Their gods have come into their camp, they cried. This is disaster. We have never had to face anything like this before. Help! Who can save us from the, these mighty gods of Israel? They are the same gods who destroyed the, the, the Egyptians with plagues when Israel was in the wilderness. Fight as never before, Philistines. If you don't, we will become the Hebrew slaves, just as they have become ours. Stand up and fight like men. So the Philistines fought desperately and Israel was defeated again. <laughs> the, slaughter, the slaughter was great. 30,000 Israelite soldiers died on that day. The survivors turned and fled to their tents and the ark of God was captured and Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were killed. So these guys have brought in the ark of the covenant because they think it will save them. In return, it has scared the Philistines, but they have encouraged themselves and said, you know what, we are going to just fight. Like we're going to put so much zeal in this fight more than we've ever put before. So they came and actually defeated the Israelites and they killed much more, a bigger, even a bigger number than the number they had killed before the Ark of the Covenant was there. And in, on top of that, they captured the Ark of the Covenant and they killed the two sons of Eli, which who is Hophni and Phinehas, just like the the the, the guy who had who had 
come to the message tell Ellie say it would happen and that is exactly how it happened all right so when all this is happening a man from the tribe of Benjamin this is verse 12 a man from the tribe of Benjamin ran from the battlefield and arrived at Shiloh later the same day he had torn his clothes and put dust on his head to show his grief Eli was waiting beside the road to hear the news of the battle for his heart was trembled for the safety of the ark of god this actually the guy is more worried about the ark of the covenant than he's worried about his sons who are at war so he's sitting at the roadside because he's so worried about the ark of the covenant and whether how safe it, safe it is when the messengers when the messenger arrived and told what had happened the outcry resounded throughout the town what's all this noise about eli asked the messenger rushed over to eli who was 98 years old and blind. He said to Eli, I've just come from the battlefield and I was there this very day. What happened, my son? Eli demanded. Israel has been defeated by the Philistines. The messenger replied, the people have slaughtered and your, the people have been slaughtered and you, your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were also killed and the ark of God has been captured. When the messenger mentioned, mentioned what had happened to the ark of God, Eli fell backward from his seat beside the gate. He broke his neck and he died, for he was old and overweight. He had been Israel's judge for 40 years. So the, Eli's actually reaction, rather a reaction to falling, was a reaction because of what had happened to the ark of God. It wasn't about what his sons, or the fact that his sons had died. It says, let me repeat it, verse 18, 18 says, when the messenger mentioned what had happened to the ark of God, Eli fell backwards from his seat beside the gate. He broke his neck and died, for he was old and overweight. He had been Israel's judge for 40 years. Eli's daughter-in-law, the wife of Phinehas was pregnant and near her time of delivery when she heard about the ark of God had been captured and that her father-in-law and husband were dead. She went into labor and gave birth. She died in childbirth, but before she passed away, the midwife tried to encourage her. Don't be afraid, they said. You have a baby boy, but she did not answer to or pay attention to them. She named the child Ichabod, which means where is the glory? For she said, Israel's glory is gone. She named him that because the ark of God had been captured and because her father-in-law and her husband were dead. Then she said, the glory has departed from Israel for the ark of God has been captured. And that's the end. That is the end of the, um, that's the end of the chapter. I like the fact that, okay, I'm not sure I like it, but I'm I noticed, rather, I noticed the fact that the Ark of the Gov the Ark of the Covenant meant so much for the Israelites that I felt like in its absence, it's like God's glory had also left. Like they didn't think God ex exist existed everywhere. They thought where the Ark of the Covenant is, that is where God existed. So they were like, no, it has been captured. Means set at Atuna God. Anyway, the main events in this chapter are number one that there's a battle between Israelites and Philistines. Now the prophecy of God comes to pass where the two sons of Eli, the priest, die in battle on the same day. And when the news got to Eli, the father, he seemed more saddened that the Ark of the Government, got, Ark of the Covenant, <laughs> I'm saying Ark of the Government, <laughs> Ark of the Covenant had been stolen than that both his sons are dead. He seemed more saddened by the Acts of the Covenant than the fact that the sons were dead. We also see Eli's daughter-in-law dying on the same day. All right. So in this chapter, it seems that the Israelites had more reverence for the Ark of the Covenant, the actual box that they had for God. They had more than they had, that more reverence for that Ark than they actually had for God. They actually thought that they could use it as a lucky charm. They thought if we bring it to the camp, to the battle camp, we will win. It will help us win. They wanted to use it as a lucky charm. But God, Ninani, you cannot mock God. So they received a worse beating and a worse slaughter than they had even received before they brought the Ark of the Covenant to the camp. Because you cannot mock God. You're not going to use him as a lucky charm. That's not going to happen. You see, the thing is sometimes we have reference for things that are closely related to God more than we have reference for God himself. 
For example, the cross. If you see a cross somewhere, and this probably will also happen to me, if you see a cross somewhere, I'm more likely to bow or pay some sort of respect to it. Yet, God exists everywhere, and I, people live their lives however they see fit. So people will be living their lives whatever they, however they f- see fit, everywhere else where God exists, but immediately they see a cross. Now, there is more reference. There is bowing down, there is silence, there is kunyanyakea and all that. I've also seen some people place more reference on, let's say, something like anointing oil and holy water than they actually place reverence on God. Another example is how much weight we place on religious acts, like going to church, fasting, and not to say that these things are bad and shouldn't be done. No, that is not what I'm saying. Please not misquote me. All I'm saying is sometimes we will place more reverence and fear and respect for those religious acts more than we have reverence, respect, and fear for God himself. So my challenge for you is check yourself. Do you have reverence for God or do you have reverence for godly things? Do you, let me repeat that, do you have reverence for God himself or do you have reverence for God's godly things like the cross, anointing oil, holy water, the religious acts? Like, are you religious or are you having a relationship with God? It's basically that. Do you have a reverence for God or do you have a rev- more reverence for religious acts? So, take some time, reflect on it, check yourself. And then do what needs to be done. Because you have seen what has happened to these guys who had more reference to the ark more than they actually had reverence for God. This is your girl Wakeji Kamore. And this has been Reflections by Wakeji Kamore. See you tomorrow.